Hello there, everybody. Your August 13th edition of AM Sports Live is now on the air. Welcome. I am Andrew Goldstein, and I am here with my partner, Matt Markow. Matt, how's life treating you these days? It's going great. Uh, my fantasy baseball team, I know no one wants to hear about about fantasy. but uh, We're looking at you, Ray Caglianoni. Yeah, uh, but my fantasy team did make the playoff, so I'm excited about that. All right. Um, just saw, obviously, over the weekend, huge weekend, been TV, Breaking Bad came back, um, saw Elysium, the Matt Damon movie, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to be on the show. Well, we're going to talk about both of those things, but Breaking Bad and Elysium, when we get to our pop culture segment later on, because... As the resident czar of pop culture, at uh, in our, you know, uh, at least out of people I know, and maybe even around Princeton High School, I assume you have some very strong thoughts on those. Well, listen, uh, yeah, on a show with you to be the czar of pop culture, you just kind of need to know just very basic stuff. You know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean. Although. Uh, I did see a very classic movie over the weekend, and we're going to break it down a little bit later in the show. You were actually really proud of me for seeing this. Uh, the Fugitive with Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. The suspense is killing me when we, we, when we get to that segment. Yeah, and, but that's the thing. We try and save the best for last on this show as a cheap way to make you keep listening. Uh, so we're going to start with this. I actually had... A uh, little story from a couple days ago, I think it was about two days ago, that I wanted to share on this show because I know it's going to set you off on a rant. It certainly set me off on one. But um, I you know, on Sunday, our school has a peer leaders program, and I was at the retreat. And Very, very exclusive program, by the way. Only the... Uh... The best and the brightest get selected for that, right? Mm-hmm, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the best and the brightest. I'm going to stop patting myself on the back now. I know, um, don't hurt your arm patting yourself on the back, really. But uh, we're doing an icebreaker activity, you know, one of those uh, one of those things where people go around and say they like this, they don't like that, blah, 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 blah. By the and, way, uh, this activity I told you before... Weird, because you've been going to school with these people for three years. I mean, I I guess, but I get the point of it. Like, you're, it's showing you what to do with the freshmen when they get in, because they haven't known each other forever, and... Do you, do you remember when we were freshmen, by the way? I do remember. I was insufferable as a freshman. Uh, I know. Like, let's look back. It's just so, it's so cringeworthy. It's like, it's like watching an episode of The Office. It's like the cringeworthy humor. No, like... Uh, you by the office you mean the post Steve Carell office? No, I mean just like the type of humor on the office. Like sometimes it would just make you cringe because it was just so awkward for the characters. Oh, I know what you mean. Like, like there were some moments where you just kind of put your head down in your hands because you're just embarrassed for them, right. like that but they you, had to do at that. At the same time, at the same time, you were laughing also. Right, right. It was funny, and that's how I feel about me as a freshman it's like wow that was incredibly embarrassing but at the same time it's also actually so pathetic it's funny yeah like i wish that facebook had a button where you could set a date and delete everything you posted before that date because i don't even want to look at anything i posted on facebook in freshman year that's essentially what i did i actually did a bit of house cleaning couple months ago and uh i mean there was just stuff on there that was just embarrassing but I, i'm actually it's it's good that it's deleted now now i barely post on facebook but back then i would be on there you know almost weekly and i would post things that i would think were funny but then when i go back and look at it it's like boy that's that's really bad yeah, I I was kind of the same way, but uh, I I almost don't even want to go back there and look at them. I I would just assume that nobody is interested in seeing what I posted in 2010. Right. It's and, like it's like watching a horror movie 
you, you you put your hands up over your eyes and you kind of just look through the cracks, you know? Exactly. Just like that. So, that's who I'm going to be dealing with come October. And just to put it in context, I would not have wanted freshman year Andrew in my peer group. I would not have wanted that to happen. Um, right. Well, but but to be fair... You weren't the only, like, there were a lot of people. Oh, yeah, there were a lot of people. Like, I'm not saying I was the only one, but still. Like, the I. Sad part, the sad part is the people that haven't changed. Right. Freshman year. That's when you know, like, you need to do some damage control. Exactly. But, anyways, what we were doing was, uh, it was a nice break. It was introducing ourselves to people who we haven't met yet. And you said I went to school with these people for three years, but there was still a healthy amount of people there that I just knew nothing about other than their names. So that was... And it also showed us what to do with the freshmen, but... The well, po- at least you know their names. With me, it's like, there's what's-his-nose over there. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, for our listening audience, we should clarify this. Mark Howe, not necessarily a people person. No. No, I'm like, uh... I'm more of a, hey, slugger, you know? <laughs> uh, hey there, tiger. I, I don't really, I'm not really good with names. Hey, champ. Yeah, hey, champ. It's your name, champ, right? <laughs> hey, guy is my favorite for some reason. <laughs> but, yeah, go ahead. Well, if you were using that in the 1950s, somebody actually could have been named guy. And that would have That's been right. pretty fortunate. But, uh, anyways, one of the icebreakers was kind of a musical chairs kind of thing where if... Somebody stood in the middle, said something like, uh, stand up if you have blank, or stand up if you like blank, and everybody who that statement applied to would get up and try to switch seats. Now, I use this to conduct a little social experiment. You know, you've known me for a long time, and I've known you for a long time. We both don't like modern music. Is that a fair statement? <sighs> modern music... I... As a whole, now, people are going to say, you know, there's some indie stuff that's great, there's some stuff that's not mainstream, whatever. But whenever I turn on, like... The top 90, 50 stations. Yeah, 94.5 PST or whatever, the pop stuff, the stuff that is popular now that is playing on the radio, I believe is devoid of, of any musical creativity or... It, it's almost like it's not even music. It's like it's um, auto tuned to hell, essentially. Auto tuned, and and it's not even like you know back back uh, in the seventies and eighties. Well, it got bad in the eighties, but seventies, sixties, you could actually hear like you heard like when Jimi Hendrix was on his guitar. Like, you heard you know, an actual guitar. You heard actual pianos being played. And it just took skill, and it's like wow. When when Keith Richards plays that riff in uh, you know Sympathy for the Devil, that's like really really good. That's that's a guy at the top of his game, and you can appreciate the kind of talent that it takes to do that. Right. And today it's just the same beat, the same drum beat, the mm-hmm. same you know uh, electronic. Like the weird. same, and also nobody reinvents themselves today. Taylor Swift in 10 years will probably still be doing songs about how she broke up with somebody. Uh, Lil Wayne will still be making unrecognizable lyrics. Hmm. Like, nobody, and nobody is kind of saying, no, this isn't working, or, you know what, maybe this gimmick has gotten old, maybe it's time for me to switch to something else. Like, nobody's doing that anymore. Well, the sad thing is, you mentioned Taylor Swift, she's actually one of the more talented musicians out there today because she can actually play an instrument and her songs don't actually sound completely all right uh, that that is true however her audience is you know teenage girls Mm -hmm. it's not like her songwriting is mature but it's just at least she has some semblance of talent the people like Katy perry or rihanna those are the people that are really just devoid of any musical creativity talent I mean, it's just, uh, uh, they're just singers, and their voices aren't even that good. Exactly. So, what this has to do with the peer leader thing is, when I was in the middle uh, two times and I had to say something, I said, okay, let me use this to conduct a little social experiment. Mm -hmm. My first statement was, how many people here like Bruce Springsteen? 
like, out of 60 people, I'm going to say 8 or 9 of them got up. Out of 60. And then, for my second time, I said, okay, how many people have heard of Bruce Springsteen before I mentioned him? Like, 15 or 20 people got up. Alright, and you didn't mention the most important part. We live in... New, New Jersey. Jersey, yes! We live in goddamn New Jersey! New Jersey, in... which is the Springsteen... I mean, maybe New York, too. No, no, New Jersey is. New Jersey, yes. It, it'd be one thing if we were living in, like, Alabama or Colorado or any place where Bruce Springsteen is just a regular music star, but we're in the Northeast, and specifically, we're in New Jersey. He's, like... He is New Jersey. I don't know how you could grow up here and not hear of him. Exactly. Which, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. And this was, I mean, the, the bad part is, all right, uh, I can understand maybe people not liking Bruce Springsteen or not being familiar with his work, but only a third of the people even have heard the name before. How is that even possible? I mean, I guess maybe people have different standards for hearing of him. Some people say, oh, if I heard his name, that's good enough. Some people say, if I I have to have heard one of his songs. So maybe that's where the discrepancy came from. But still, th this, is, this was just depressing for me. Right. And I remember you getting into another argument with somebody a couple weeks ago where you were talking about... Uh, Bruce Springsteen or, or Sinatra or somebody, and they were like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't ever listen to that. That's that's for my parents. That's my parents' music. That's it, that's before my time. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to call out... Uh, I'm going to actually call out my co-host on the other show that I do for National Sports NFL Goal Line Live, Nick Rice. I mean, re re really nice guy. I like him, but... When I started talking to him about Springsteen and Sinatra and Billy Joel and all that good stuff, he said, well, that's the music that my parents listen to. Well, your parents are right on this one. Well, yeah. As if what? My parents listen to it, so... So that disqualifies it as good music. Oh, yeah, so I'm sorry for the confusion. My parents listen to it. No, good music is good music. And listen, and, and, and even today, like I can say... There are some songs that are out there today that I think are pretty good. Like the new song uh, by uh, Robin Thicke, the, the number one song. You know the song Blurred Lines? I've heard of it before. I've never actually listened. That's a good song. It's a good song. It's, it's you know, it's good. And there are people like Adele who have actual good yeah. voices and talent. I'm not saying that the modern scene's completely devoid of it. Right, exactly. There are good songs out there. And the same thing back then. You can't... There's a reason why bands like the Beatles are the best-selling artists of all time. Do you know what I mean? Yes, because they're good at what they do. And, but, it, but it's weird because it's a weird double standard because it's like uh, when Michael Jackson died, everyone was into him, right? Right. And, and even now, like, everyone loves Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. But... He was before everyone's time also. Yeah, he was from the 80s, and actually through the 90s and the early 2000s when a lot of the criminal charges were brought against him and uh, he started kind of going off the deep end a little bit, he was considered just a cautionary tale. Like, he dropped really quickly, and then when he died, a lot of his stuff became popular again. Right, but I'm saying, so what is it, uh... Michael Jackson, it's okay to like him, because he was only 10 years before people were born in this generation, but it's not okay to like Springsteen, because his heyday was 20 years before? I don't understand the logic there. Mm-hmm. Well... I, that's, that's strange to me. Well, the good news is, um, what, on one of the other icebreaker activities, one of the questions that was brought up was, I named the most embarrassing song you've ever listened to. And, uh, I said dancing in the streets, uh, and thankfully, thankfully, nobody else in the group knew what that was. So, I feel like maybe there is a little bit of upside in restricting yourself to the 
past couple years time frame because oh, yeah. that means you don't know what dancing in the streets is you don't know what duran duran union of the snake is uh, yeah but, well um yeah that's another thing people are like okay well uh so you like you like older music but older music wasn't all that good either and i say yes that's true in every era there's always going to be artists that are to just put out just bland, just music that is just really grating to listen to. Yeah, because what artists try to do is they try to, because the trend setters, like the artists that are popular, use their talents to start a trend. The artists that kind of really don't catch on and are the bad ones that we're talking about right now just try to fit the trend at all costs. So in the 70s, you had a lot of awful disco music yeah. in addition to all the good stuff being produced. In the 80s, you had a lot of really bad dance music, for instance. Uh, yeah. Well, my argument is always, yes, there was some really awful stuff that was being put out back then. However, if you look at the music back then and you look at it now, there was a lot more quality stuff it, there was a there was a much higher ratio of quality stuff to bad stuff coming out then than there is now. Right, and also maybe this is inaccurate. I'm gonna have to go ask my parents or ask somebody who's lived in that generation for their take on it. But it seems like there's a much higher rate of exclusivity to today's music than there was 20 years ago or 30 years ago because. I don't, somebody growing up in the 70s and listening to Billy Joel and the Beatles and all that, they probably wouldn't say, who's Frank Sinatra? Or who's Dean Martin? No, of course not. I mean, maybe this is just me pining for times that never existed, and I hate when people do that, but it does feel like today's generation of music is just so exclusive like people just don't look 20 years outside of 2013 people don't even look five ten years back like, exactly really uh no one no one really knew ever, so, like there were a bunch of artists i'm sure that just came out that had one hit wonders back in like like the guys that um did like who let the dogs out? Oh, the Baja Men. The Baja Men, right? They were forgotten very quickly. Yeah, within I think like six months. <laughs> and, and 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 you know stuff like that, but but so yeah, there were, I'm sure there were a lot of artists that were just uh, forgotten. And in today's day and age, it's it's you know you have to stay relevant now. It's, it's what have you done for me lately. Exactly. And I feel like when artists try, when artists of times past try to update their work and try to appeal to a modern audience, it doesn't work and it ends up compromising the stuff they've already done. So I feel like Billy Joel played it best when he just didn't release a new album or hasn't released a new album for years and years and years. And I feel like that's the right move. He didn't want to compromise what he had already done just to try and cash a few more paychecks. Well, and also I think there's a there's a window for a great artist. Absolutely. You, your absolute peak is only about eight years, maybe ten absolute maximum. And then after that, everything else is kind of... And that's... What's so remarkable about the Beatles is that they were able to just keep reinventing themselves. Yeah, they went through basically an entire career arc. They went from, like, boy band to, like, psychedelic drug band to, like, really deep, like, super, like, virtuoso musician guys in, in, in the span of, like, six years. Exactly. Imagine if Justin Bieber tomorrow started making music like like Billy Joel. Uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially the transformation. Don't degrade Billy Joel's music by suggesting that Justin Bieber could do it. 
I'm just saying <laughs> as an example. Oh, I know, I know you were, but just hearing their names mentioned with in close proximity brings tears to my eyes, and they're not tears of joy. Well, what the Beatles did, it, it would be like One Direction going from uh, whatever their crappy song is. Uh, what's it called? Uh, I don't girl, even... Girlfriend or something, I don't know. Going from that to Born to Run. In, in, in the span of like two years. It, it would be unbelievable, and I usually consider myself somewhat of a mild-mannered guy, usually pretty reasonable in my opinions, but music is the one topic where I just completely lose my boundaries. Yeah, well, I, I think it, it goes in cycles because uh, 60s and 70s were, were great, and then early 80s was good, late 80s kind of got bad, and then 90s got kind of good again, and then... Now it's it's on the downturn, but but who knows? Maybe in the future it'll. But the problem is, everything now is pop. Everything is like, you know, the the it's everything's made for teenage girls. You know what I mean? Exactly, and music has become so entwined with corporate life. Like it used to be, the Beatles or Billy Joel or Michael Jackson in a studio or Ray Charles in a studio. And whoever was there, like, the producer would be like, all right, just back the hell away and let them do their thing. But now it's our marketing research shows that teenage girls or the 18 to 25 demo and guys listen to music for this amount of time. So to sell the most albums or to sell the most songs on iTunes, you need to make a song that hits this genre and this theme. It's just... It's taken away from the artist. Yeah, it, there, you can definitely tell which artists are definitely just productions of of, uh, of a studio. You exactly. Know, just, like, Katy Perry is probably manufactured, Justin Bieber is, like, manufactured to, to be this this person. There, it's not like a, it's not like an organic person it's it's exactly. manufactured to specifically cater to a certain audience right well we could go on all day about music but uh we have some important sports and pop culture things to discuss so we're gonna let that rest for a while but we might uh continue that debate or continue that discourse on future shows but mark i wanted to talk to you about something i was thinking about the other day which is i wonder which athletes would have been most amazing to see? Athletes that played before you and I were born or who played before you and I were old enough to appreciate them. So give me like three athletes that you would have liked to see that you didn't get the chance to see. Well, obviously, uh, Michael Jordan has got to be up there. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, he'd probably be one of them. I mean, just looking at his highlight highlights are incredible. But imagine if you were alive or really old enough to appreciate what he did against the Jazz and what should have been his last game. What was that? Game six of the nineteen ninety eight finals. Yeah, and that would have been incredible to watch live. Uh, absolutely, Michael Michael Jordan's on there for me too. Really. Jordan probably wouldn't be number one if only because LeBron is a transcendent basketball player that I get to see every day. And not to compare Jordan to LeBron because I hate when people do that, but, yeah. you know, I get to see a transcendent basketball player that, while not necessarily Jordan, does a pretty decent impression of him. So he'd be on there, but he wouldn't be number one for me. I, I'd. Probably. I'd have to think of something that I hadn't seen yet. The problem with comparing Jordan to LeBron is they're very different players. They are. It, because LeBron is more of a... I mean, he's a forward, first of all, and he definitely has a different game. Like, Jordan was focused more on scoring. Yeah, he was a pure two-guard. Yeah, he was a, he was two-guard, exactly. Or LeBron. Yeah, more apt comparison for Jordan would be Kobe, I feel. Do you agree? 
Yes, they're definitely more similar than I than LeBron and Jordan, but obviously all every all anyone wants to compare is is Jordan and LeBron because because of the uh, well, one was the greatest basketball player in his day, and then now LeBron has kind of taken over that. Exactly. And so historically, yeah, there there needs to be some sort of a comparison. But yeah, I think Kobe and LeBron is a, is a much more uh, much more apt comparison. Yes. Well, what what about what about you? Uh, what athlete would you? Well, here's the thing. I've thought about this a lot, and I would really want to see Lawrence Taylor because I've not seen in my lifetime just a truly dominating linebacker. I mean, I wasn't old enough to appreciate Ray Lewis and Brian Urlacher in their primes, and today we have DeMarcus Ware, we have uh, guys like Alden Smith who can rack up sacks and get tackles, and I've seen very, very good linebackers at an age where I've been old enough to appreciate them, but I haven't seen just a legendary one. And that's well, why I want to go Michael back and Strahan. see Lawrence Taylor. What about Michael Strahan? Strahan, well, first of all, he was more of a defensive end. But no, secondly, Strahan, I think he went out in 2007, 2008. And I'm putting the cutoff on this, for me anyways, at 2008. Because before sixth grade, I had obviously an idea of what was going on, but... I couldn't really appreciate the fact that I would never see this again, potentially. Right. Well, a lot of people mm-hmm. thought that J.J. I mean, not, not J.J. Watt, uh, Clay Matthews was, was going to be kind of the next dominating linebacker. And, and obviously he's really good, but um, he does these crappy State Farm commercials. That yeah, but that's reason. another thing. Could you ever imagine Lawrence Taylor... Is, like trademarking the discount double check. Yeah, those really need to end, don't they? Well, actually, I was thinking of segment ideas for us the other day, and maybe we could get some audience input on this, but uh, around the time of NBA playoffs or NFL playoffs or just something where we're going to be watching TV for long stretches of time, I want to do a segment where we break down the commercials and make fun of them. Because I feel like that... That's just the easiest segment in the world, and I can't believe nobody's done it yet. Well, you always see these these beer commercials where it, there's like a there's like a party going on. One guy of every race in the foreground. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'm not talking about those. There, there's there's other ones where there's just like a bunch of young hipsters uh, having a party on some secluded beach somewhere, right? Or, or or some rooftop or something, and there's a concert going on, and there's a bonfire, and it's like. Where are these happening? Does this happen in real life? Like, could I get invited to that party? Yeah. How do I get on the list? I don't think this really happens where all of a sudden, like, you crack open a beer and you're transported to this this beach and there's just a bunch of good-looking people dancing around a fire while, uh, you know, the guitarist shreds some uh, popular song, you know? Well, actually, I saw this Corona commercial and this just cracked me up. It was just what you were describing, beach, um, party, boombox, whatever. Then the sun went down, and they switched everything off. And I'm like, oh, okay, finally, this is realistic. You know, it's sundown, maybe you gotta go home or uh, get back from this secluded island somehow. Yeah, it's always and then, nobody's around. But then they just carry everything to the other side of the island for no reason, and then just start the party again. The, it's like, how, how do these young people have have the time and the money and and the resources to do this? You know what I mean? Like, I could see uh, Bill Gates throwing down with Warren Buffett, but, uh, it, you know, when you're 22 and broke out of college, I don't think there's a lot of time to be partying on some rooftop in New York. Oh, you know what commercial I love? You know the one where the guy... Where, like, the people come into the apartment, and the guy sitting on the couch, and he's like, it was here the last time the 49ers won the Super Bowl. I sat in this, no, no, this exact spot. It's my lucky seat. And yeah. then this was just playing over and over. 
And the weird thing is, I don't even remember what exactly that was advertising for. At Me all. Either. I think it was I, maybe an NFL-related thing, but either way, it's not like if a stranger shows up at my house and knocks on the door and says, I need to watch TV <laughs> from a specific couch cushion. We're just gonna call the police because it's exactly someone with a neurological. Disorder. No, you just like turn the turn the garden hose on him or something. <laughs> I'm not gonna be. Yeah, come on in, sit down, watch the game with us. Here, have some have some chips, have some wings. Well, actually, if you were a Jets fan, I I would consider it. I mean, it's been 45 years. I any I'll try anything at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. but you know, if you were a Pats fan. You guys won the Super Bowl, what is it, three times in the last 12 or 13 years, made five Super Bowls? You're doing okay. You can afford to not have a crazy guy on your couch. I don't know. The way this pet season is looking, who knows? Oh, boy. I mean, this looks, this has the potential to be either a disaster or uh, a team that's that's just good enough, like 10 and 6, 11 and 5, and then goes on a run in the playoffs. That's those are the two scenarios. I don't think they're going to go thirteen and three, fourteen and two. Like uh, I think they could go a lot. I think they could go twelve and four, thirteen and three. I really think they could. And then look at the receivers, though. Yeah, but here's the thing, and maybe this is why I think this. Back in two thousand nine, the season after Brady got hurt, got his ACL torn, I thought, okay, this is it. Pats are on the ropes. They can't survive for much longer. Like. Brady's in his 30s, he tore his ACL, he, it's just not going to work. And they were able to put together a fairly successful season. So after that, I thought, all right, this is it. And it wasn't, 14-2. and two. And then for every year since, I thought that, all right, maybe this is the season. And they proved me wrong so many times that I've just learned not to question them until Brady or Belichick isn't there. Yeah, that's true. But... That, the, the Matt Castle season was really surprising, but people don't remember their schedule was incredibly easy. And they, I mean, even though they went 11 and 5, it was a pretty weak 11 and 5. But again, and, and they had Moss and Welker, and Moss when he was still kind of trying. And uh, so. But I know in 2010, they went 14 and 2, even though they traded Moss like mid season, or even before mid season. I think. Welker was their number one receiver, but their deep threat was... I don't even remember who it was. Well, they haven't had a deep threat for the past three or four years. Yeah, this was before Lloyd. This was after Moss, 2010 season, when they went 14-2 and two and just started dominating for the last month and a half. And they were able to make it work with pretty minimal help there. Yeah, they, are, they are a team that... It, it is weird because every time you count them out... It, they just not only will they win 14 games but about eight of those games it'll be almost by like 20 points yeah and, and it's, it's it's really but it's a real treat when you see like a sunday night game like pats ravens or something like those games are really really fun to watch and yeah i i always enjoy pats ravens i enjoy pats, pats broncos, steelers pats broncos that's another one and but see with the jets the only the only time they're really competitive is when they're against the Jags or or the uh, the Browns. But know? I mean, that's the thing. For two years there, we had something, and I thought that that was gonna be the team. That was it. They were gonna break this Super Bowl drought, but it just imploded. And maybe it was kind of predisposed to imploding because. They brought in a pretty volatile mix of personalities, so when some of them started to decline, the ones that weren't started mouthing off, they started not trying as hard, and eventually that started to drag the whole team down until we end up in what we're in today. But How do you, how do you feel about San Antonio Holmes? Oh, I hate San Antonio Holmes. I never really forgave him after... If any Jets fans or Dolphins fans out there are listening, they probably remember this more than anybody else. But last day of the 2011 season, Jets had a pretty long shot at making the playoffs. It almost happened, but it didn't. Uh, 
last game in Miami, it was 19-10. to 10. Sanchez was uh, going back out onto the field. And Santonio Holmes, first of all, nearly gets into a fist fight with a teammate in the huddle. And then he just sits on the bench and sulks for uh, for the remaining half of the quarter. He then pretends to reform for the coaches long enough to convince them to keep him and pay him his roster bonus. And then he goes and blames the press for making him look bad. He said, uh, you know, he actually said this, that the press was, quote unquote, against the Jets for most of the season. And he started blaming them for a variety of their problems. And I'm thinking, Santonio, what do you think the press is reporting? Are, after that Miami game, are they going to ask you what your favorite pregame meal is? No, they're going to ask you about how you nearly punched out a teammate. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah the Jets, they should just start over, right? Yeah, like, that's it's, a, it's time. this it's year, time. they blow everything up. It's, I want them to win one game, at least one game. I don't want us to go to 0-16 Lions territory, but if we're 1-15, that's fine with me. I I want Jadavian Clowney. That's a guy you want to rebuild with. Well, it, as weird as as uh, as bad as I feel for you for having to sit through this next season with this guy starting, Mark Sanchez might be the starter again this year. I'm fine with that actually because here's the thing: the Jets have no offensive line except for Nick Mangold, and he's like the only player left on that team that I really like, Nick Mangold. No wide receivers. Their top running back is Bilal Powell, for God's sake. Hey, they got Chris Ivory from the Saints. Oh, that's true, that's true. But Chris Ivory's been working through some injuries, so effectively, right now, it's Bilal Powell. Why would you throw Geno Smith into this situation? I love how the most exciting Jets acquisition was Chris Ivory. Hey, Chris Ivory, hey! I mean, I can't blame them too much for that, because... Like, I can blame the Jets for a lot of things, but one thing I can't say is that they didn't try to sign big free agents or they didn't try to be a part of big trades. They've done a very good job of that within their budget over the last couple of years. It hasn't already, it hasn't always worked out, but I can appreciate their initiative in trying to do it. And when you have multiple off seasons in a row where you try to get involved with the big moves, there are seasons like this one where your budget won't allow it. So, yeah, they, they I can really, accept that. They never really seem to be the team that gets the splashy free agent signing. Well, that's the thing. Holmes was a very splashy signing at the time. The Sanchez deal uh, in the draft would probably rank among the top five or top three offseason stories from that year. Uh, they went out, they signed Bart Scott to a big contract. They were very proactive in re-signing David Harris. Um, they haven't been as proactive on the offensive side of the ball, but there really weren't many fantastic offensive free agents in the last couple of years that lined up with the Jets' budget. I mean, obviously, if they had money to spend this year, they would have loved to go after Mike Wallace or a guy like, uh, Long from the, uh, Chris Long from the Rams. Yeah. I mean, I forget whether Chris Long or Jake Long is the offensive tackle. I should know this. Jake, I think Jake it's... Long is the offensive is it Jake? Jake is the offensive. And, and then Chris is the defensive. Oh, okay, it's Jake Long. My bad. Yeah, they would have loved to pursue a guy like Jake Long, maybe, if their budget allowed for it. But I feel like it was more bad timing that they couldn't sign a marquee free agent on offense. But I appreciate their initiative. Yeah. Well, and have you heard about the Geno stuff, too? Yes, I have. Is he going to be okay for the season, or I'm not... Seth with his ankle, right? Yeah, so he sprained his ankle. Um, I I wouldn't play him... Th- I wouldn't even play him this season if he didn't have a sprained ankle. Just because I think there's no benefit to throwing him into a bad situation where you're not going to be a contender in the first place. So why go 6-10 and 10 and potentially ruin your quarterback's confidence? Yeah, that's, that's a good idea, actually, but... Anyway, what were we? We went on this big tangent, didn't we? We did, but here's the thing. We are going to discuss athletes that played before our time, but I want to wrap that up in the next couple minutes because we got to get to the main event. we got to do Breaking Bad, Elysium, and The Fugitive. So 
very quickly, are there any more athletes that played before your time that you forgot or you might want to include? Well, there's Jordan. And in terms of football, I would have liked to have seen Barry Sanders. Ooh, that's another one. Yeah, I would have liked to see him. Because my dad actually talks about him all the time as being pretty much the best running back he's ever seen. Wow. Uh, play, play the game. And then you see the highlights, and it's like he just takes these impossible cuts and impossible angles. Like, it, it's it's crazy that... It's it's sad actually that that his Lions teams were never more successful. It was kind of like a, a wasted career almost. But some of the plays he made were like incredible and almost impossible to comprehend. Yeah, I probably would like to see him too. Uh, one more athlete that I would like to see, and this is the last one, probably Muhammad Ali. I would have liked to watch a, a couple of his fights uh, when he was in his prime because we haven't seen anything like him since and i'm not sure we ever will well it's also due to the fact that boxing was a huge huge deal back then yeah and right right now boxing isn't even almost not even discussed in terms of in terms of sports right yeah that's true but then again we have to ask whether that was part of the culture that boxing was big or whether it was muhammad ali who just elevated boxing to such a to that next level because Al, they had ali they had foreman uh so, sonny liston before uh cassius clay who changed his name to muhammad ali beat him i mean that was a golden age of boxing and people paid attention so i wonder if we've moved on from boxing or if boxing is just kind of in a spell where there are no big talents yeah, well, even uh, when Tyson was big, that boxing was big too. Mm-hmm. I guess because of Tyson, maybe. Absolutely. And well, then, yeah. Well, now, now it's not. Now it's like Floyd Mayweather, but but no one really cares. Yeah, the only thing that people care about is a Mayweather-Pacquiao fight that was probably never going to happen. Yeah, and uh, actually, so, something happened to Pacquiao recently, right? That it was like. Uh, did Pacquiao lose recently, controversially or something? Yeah, that was like last year, I think. And and that that kind of uh, yeah the prospects of, of yeah they think it might be character. fixed or something, and you know I wouldn't be surprised to find out that it is. But um, you know, good that was a good discussion. We'll probably end up returning to that topic sometime in the future because there's still a lot of good things to be explored there and. Um, since we're kind of changing gears, this might be a good time to plug some of our social media aspects that we've created. Uh, just follow us on Twitter at AM Sports Live One. Uh, you could like our Facebook page for show updates, AM Sports Live, and email any questions or uh, suggestions about athletes that you might have liked to see that were before your time to uh, AM Sports Live at gmail.com. So, Main event. First things first, we have to talk Breaking Bad and Elysium because you were very excited about both of those. Did you uh, hear anything about Breaking Bad? I heard that the first episode was very, very good. I, I'm guessing you didn't turn in. I did not. I was first of all, I was at the Pure Later retreat till nine thirty on Sunday, and then I immediately rushed home to watch the newsroom. <laughs> oh, that's on Sunday night too, isn't it? Yeah, it's at ten. Boy, that's a tough decision. And I'm pretty sure that Sorkin might have scheduled his season so that the worst episode corresponded with the opening of Breaking Bad. He kind of, Maybe he kind of thought, um, well, you know what? I'm not going to outcompete Breaking Bad. There's no use in wasting any of my good ones. I'm just going to... I'll schedule it so the worst ones on this Sunday. Oh, really? It's, it, was, it was bad this week? It was pretty bad this week. It, I mean, it wasn't awful like i i'd still watch it it was just it was confusing like you know how sorkin is where sometimes he'll just go off the deep end with his writing and like the characters will be talking at 200 words per minute like constantly and usually that's good if it's done in like 10 or 15 second spurts but if it's done in any more than that it's like wait what are they saying anymore 
I was actually watching this clip, and I have to give a lot of credit to the newsroom. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, but it was very prophetic because a character was talking to another character, the, the one guy worked in the government, and he was exposing the a kind of like a, a spying scandal, like the NSA stuff that uh -huh, was going on. The global clarity plot line from like the last three episodes of last season. Right, and that was before this whole NSA stuff ever came out. So I was actually pretty impressed with that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that actually played as part of the show. Was that a good storyline or? Well, that's the thing. They never actually ran the story because the guy they de they deemed the guy to be like an uh non credible source. I mean, like, for the accusations that they were making, because, like, they couldn't find another source, and there's, like, one guy who's, who, like, they lowered his security clearance, and they're like, well, maybe we shouldn't jeopardize the entire network just to put out a story that may or may not be accurate, because they were, that would have essentially been accusing the federal government of spying. Um, right, but still. Yeah, I mean, but still, bad. I... I get what you're saying, though. Sorkin's ability to, to predict that was, I mean, at the very least, a lucky coincidence, and at best, if it was intentional, very, very good foresight on his part. Yeah, I mean, yeah, looking back, no one was, was thinking about that then, and, uh, but now, I mean, it, so I have to give it a lot of credit for that, but uh, either way, Breaking Bad, uh, should... Do you think we should spoil anything, or... Uh, if I mean, you... you know... Here's the thing. I can't spoil anything. I don't know what happened. But you... So, spoilers may or may not be ahead. It's up to Markow. He holds the listening audience's knowledge of... Knowledge or desire to know or not know what happened on the episode in the palm of his hand right now. Well, I remember last year, and, and this is a spoiler alert, definitely... People were mad at me, and I'm looking back now, and I'm saying, you know what, they're absolutely right about this. Uh, after, uh, and again, spoiler alert, there's an episode in the previous season that aired, aired last year where Walter kills Mike. And I posted on Facebook, you know, rest in peace, Mike, the show will never be the same without you, whatever. Because he really was one of the great characters in the show. And then I got such an overall negative reaction because I posted it only about 30 minutes after the, the episode aired. And I realize now... No, I can't do that. I mean, you have to wait at least... Uh, I think Bill Simmons was talking about it on his podcast the other day. There needs to be some sort of a set time. Like, what time do you think is acceptable for, for spoilers to start being major plot points of an episode that you can start talking about them in detail. Like I I feel like if it's just for general consumption, like on Facebook, or start talking about it where anybody might hear it, I'd say one week. Because for our high school, usually people are very busy during the week doing, uh, you know, studying for tests, doing college applications, whatever. And then on Friday or a night where they might not have as much work, they'll set aside a block of time to watch Breaking Bad or to watch some of the shows that they missed over the weekend. But I feel like if they can't watch it within one week or they don't watch it within one week, then unless they explicitly tell you, don't spoil it for me, it's okay to say something. Uh, well, in the Simmons podcast, they settled on 72 hours, which... I think is a fair amount of time. A week, I feel like, is, is too long. But that's the thing. I feel like, like, Simmons works in an atmosphere where pop culture is a very, very important part of their jobs. He works at Grantland, uh, grantland.com, a very popular sports blog, and it's part of certain writers' jobs to know pop culture, and everybody there is very invested in pop culture in some form or another, so three days might be appropriate for people whose jobs it is to know this stuff, but I feel like for us, where people are studying for tests and we have homework, might have after-school sports, they might legitimately want to watch Breaking Bad or want to watch Mad Men or something, but not get the chance for a whole week. I, I guess. I, well, 
I, well, also, interestingly, there has to be a different time for movies as well, because, uh, and and that should be, I feel, longer than, than a week. That should be about a month, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I've spoiled movies for Ray before. Uh, well, actually, spoiler alert ahead, not for Breaking Bad, but for something else, so... Um, like, Ray told me one time, I think it might have been in gym class or something, that he hadn't watched The Sixth Sense yet. So, um, I just blurted out, hey, you know that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time? Uh, and by the way, you probably haven't even seen The Sixth Sense. No, I have not, but everybody, like, you don't need to see The Sixth Sense to know that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. Like, the plot right. twist has outgrown the movie. But I think, all right, let's say five years. Okay, that, that's fair. Out, if a movie comes out at any time in the past five years, spoilers, you can't spoil it. You can't spoil it. But if we're talking about movies that came out, you know, if you're going to talk about, like, Pulp Fiction or something, came out in 1994, spoil away. You understand? Mm -hmm. Like. You can't, like, um, or The Godfather or whatever. Like, there's these movies that are, like, they're, they're almost, like, in the public domain, almost, you know? Yeah, but there's a caveat there. If a friend specifically asks you, no spoilers, you have to obey that. Well, you could argue the opposite. You could say he's almost asking for spoilers by saying no spoilers. No, but you know? that... Like, just to mess with him, you have to kind of spoil it. Well, that's the thing. If he, it, if it's something that we're both really looking forward to and I happen to watch it first or get a video game first or something, but I know he's going to get it in a day or two, I won't say anything because if I were in his position, I wouldn't want it spoiled for me. But if it's just kind of something casual, like you just, like Ray would just bring up, oh yeah, I haven't seen that movie and I have, I'll go ahead and spoil it for him. Because he hasn't expressed a particular desire to watch it, so, you know, I feel no shame in that. Right. Well, anyway, about Breaking Bad, uh, I don't know if I really want to discuss it right now. I feel like it's a little bit too early. Let's let's cut, kind of table it for our Friday show. Okay. okay. And because and, I re also really want to move to something that we both are familiar with. Oh, before, uh, before we do that, uh, any thoughts on Elysium? Because you saw it this oh, yes. past Friday. Uh, Elysium, disappointing. I was hoping for it to be really one of the standout movies of the summer. Of a disappointing summer, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, directed by the same guy that, that did District 9, which was a really good movie. Came out in 2009. And this was kind of a letdown in comparison to District 9. Really? And... I mean, it by no means is this a bad movie. It's just I didn't really care about the characters as much as I did in District Nine. It was kind of a straight sci-fi movie, but I feel like a lot more could have been done in the movie, especially uh, in terms of Elysium itself, which was the the space station where all the rich people live. Mm -hmm. And there just wasn't really enough of that. The movie looked great. So, I mean, in terms of, like, you know, graphics, CGI, uh, just right. the, the shots, cinematography, it looked great. Just, I don't know if the acting was there, and I don't know if the story was there. And if you're looking for just kind of a mindless kind of... It, it's not a smart movie like District 9 was, and it's way too overly... It's, it it kind of hits you in the face with the social commentary. You know what I mean? Like right. the, the rich people are are living in luxury, and the earth is is falling apart, and that's where the poor people live. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of scenes where people try to uh, get on to Elysium in spaceships. And kind of like sneak in to get health care. That's it, it's kind of like a parallel to. Uh, the immigration problem between the, the U.S. and Mexico. Yeah, like, I get what you mean. It just, it kind of forces the social commentary on you. 
yeah. in a way that's not necessarily smart. It's, it's just trying subtle. to hit you over the head with it. It's not subtle whatsoever, and at a certain point, it, it gets a little bit annoying, and it's like, listen, man, I, I just, I just want to watch an entertaining movie, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's let's go down to a movie that uh, we both agree is one of the all-time classics in the thriller genre. Yes, thriller and action. I would put this in action as well, though it's a smart action movie. It's not like. A Fast Six action movie. <laughs> this one requires some thinking. Right. Um, but I was just kind of walking around Saturday morning looking, uh, you know, just uh, went downstairs to pick something up. And I uh, saw the this movie on it and it was just starting. And uh, my dad was watching it and so was my mom. And I asked him, hey, what movie is this? They said uh, it was The Fugitive with uh, Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. So I thought, okay. I'll stay for a couple minutes and see what this is about. And I was hooked. I I loved it. And Tommy it's... Lee Jones never better, by the way. Mm-hmm. And actually, best roles ever. And actually, you were you said when I told you that I watched this movie, you said it was like a parent watching his kid ride without training wheels for the first time. And I feel like that's an apt analogy. Right. Well, usually. I mean, especially with you, it's it's really, I mean, for you to go out and watch a movie that's legitimately really, really good, I'm checking right now, 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, and for you to do that without anybody really telling you, like, obviously, I urged you to see Goodfellas, whatever, you know. Which I actually like saw again a couple nights ago. Right. And, uh, but for you to do that, really, really impressive. And, and it, it was like, it was almost like seeing, seeing someone ride without training wheels. Like I said, your, your kid ride without training wheels. But this is actually concerning yeah, for uh, me because one of the running tropes of this, uh, program was supposed to be how inept I was at pop culture. If I continue on this road, I might move up to the level of a normal person. <laughs> I know. You, you might get to average level. I might, yeah. yeah. That, let's be honest, that's probably not going to happen. But one can dream, right? Yeah, one can dream. Well, well, what did you think about The Fugitive? I really liked it. Um, let me just summarize the plot really quickly without spoiling uh, anything. This is just kind of the overview that would come on the back of the box. Uh, essentially, the main character, uh, Dr. Richard Kimball, which is play, was played by... Uh, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford. Yeah. is, what is it, an orthopedic surgeon? Uh, he's some sort of a doctor, a yeah. surgeon. It's not, it's not totally clear, I don't think. Yeah, it's a, he's a doctor, and uh, he, is, uh, he arrives home one night to find uh, his wife being attacked by a one-armed man, like a guy with a prosthetic arm, and uh, the attacker gets away, and through a series of misunderstandings, he is wrongly convicted of killing his wife. So, he's on the train to be escorted to the prison. And by the way, this is one of my favorite things that they do in action movies. When they have the prison car or the prison train that you escape from. It happens all the time. Right, yeah. Well, and actually this is one of the great scenes in the movie. Yeah, this, uh, this is one of the most famous scenes, actually. Yeah, where, uh, you know, there's a... They're on the prison bus, and then the train comes along and just demolishes the bus, and, uh, and then Harrison Ford escapes, and it's a great scene, full of suspense. And then, of course, Tom Wheelie Jones takes over. He's mm -hmm. on the case, and uh, he's not going to stop until he catches Harrison Ford's character. Exactly. And, and uh, the, whole movie, the whole movie is kind of a, a cat-and-mouse game between Harrison Ford and uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, and uh, later in the movie, you see that without giving anything away, Harrison Ford isn't so much running from Tommy Lee Jones, the U.S. Marshal, anymore, as he is trying to lead Tommy Lee Jones towards who actually did it. So right. the vibe of the movie kind of changes from cat and mouse, action, suspense from the first two hours to kind of a 
mystery whodunit type of thing in the last hour. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and the ending is a pretty surprising twist, actually. We're not going to spoil it, but, um, I mean, that it kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. And, you know, I think the ending is really, really good, but it's definitely different from... It's different tonally from uh, the first first part of the movie. All right, well, we are going to spoil a few scenes in the movie without giving away any of the plot points right. uh, because there are some things that we need to discuss. Um, one of the things that I had an issue with was the fall uh, from the sewer pipes into the dam. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's big movie stuff. Obviously, well, what, seemed, what the scene you're talking about is uh, Harrison Ford is being chased through the sewers by Tommy Lee Jones, and then uh, Tommy Lee Jones has some corner, and uh, there's a there's a pipe. They're they're both in this pipe that runs down about 200, 300 feet into a into a dam below, right? Right. And so Harrison Ford has two choices. Either Tommy Lee Jones takes him into prison right now, or he jumps 200, 300 feet into the water below. And, of course, he chooses to jump. And, obviously, the chances of someone surviving that are extremely low. And and coming out without any injuries whatsoever... It's not extremely low. It is none. You are not surviving that. That is, like, imagine jumping from something which looked about somewhere between a third and like half or two-thirds of the height of the empire state building (laughs) and not just that but it's like you're jumping into a big reservoir of water but you're not jumping off far enough from the sides to guarantee that you're not smacking the concrete on the way down and if the fall doesn't get you then the concrete will and also, not only did he survive, he was virtually unscathed. Exactly, but, and so also, is... you know that scene uh, in Titanic where the ship is sinking and they, and like, they have to jump oh, from... Oh, no. spoiler alert, the Titanic sinks in the end. Ah, oh, damn it, I, I've been meaning to watch that. I um, know, I know, it's but, the whole movie. But that's the thing, like, you know the scene where the guy said, uh, alright, take a deep breath... Like, take a big breath, you're not going to be coming up for, like, 30 or 40 seconds after you jump. Right. From that height, from the height that uh, Harrison Ford jumped, you are going to stay under for a pretty decent length of time. And you're not going to be able to catch your breath after you just jumped however many dozens, hundreds of feet it was to into this pool of water. Like, there is no physical way a human could survive that. So, they took some liberties there. But, in its defense, it was pretty freaking awesome. It was. I'm not debating that it was cool or not. It it was really nice. This movie isn't trying to be overly realistic, I don't think. It's Uh, just that, I, I mean, in terms of, like, a lot of the plot points, like the one-armed man, it seemed a little bit, a little bit shaky, you know. Mm-hmm. But but in terms of pure enjoyment, like I mean, that was just a great, great scene, great moment. I also love the scene when Harrison Ford is staying in an apartment in Chicago, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, Tommy Lee Jones or, or uh, the police pull up. To the, to the house. Mm-hmm. And it looks like they know where he is, they're going to take him in, and it turns out the guy above him was dealing drugs or something, <laughs> and, and he gets taken in. And I just thought that scene was, was great. Well, I this is a staple, it seems, in Harrison Ford action movies. This happened in Air Force One, too, where... He has one scene in the movie where he delivers a killer one-liner. Like, you know how uh, in Air Force One, it's uh, that moment where he looks into the terrorist's eyes and says, Get off my plane, before he just sends him plummeting to his death. It was uh, 
in this one, he was riding the train, and a guy comes on the train to kill him. I'm not going to spoil who that is, but, uh, like, the guy earlier, like, before he killed him was like, yeah, my stop's coming up, and then he, like, pulls out the gun, and, like, Harrison Ford, like, fights him for 30 or 40 seconds, and then Harrison finally corners him, and just second-long pause, you missed your stop, and then he just finishes him off, and that Classic, is yeah. just so perfect, but... Actually, this is one other uh, plot point in the movie that I had trouble with. This is actually just pervading throughout the whole thing. In movies like Fast 6 or Taken 2, they certainly make a lot of things unrealistic, but one thing that they don't make unrealistic is that the main character could plausibly be an action hero. Like, Liam Neeson was supposed to be a former super soldier or whatever. It's not hard to believe he could do amazing right. superhuman things and yeah and like in fast six you have a professional thief and uh played by vin diesel and a oiled up super roided soldier played by the rock it's not hard to believe they could be action heroes richard kimball is a doctor what doctor do you know of that is like jumping out of a bus before it, it like crashes into a train and explodes like dr he, evil maybe from <laughs> dr Power. evil i don't know yeah that it's a good point but really by the time the movie really gets going you've already suspended all of your disbelief yeah you've already accepted okay richard kimball can do things that i cannot do right yeah so yeah and him being a doctor plays well into into stuff later involving hospitals and stuff. But mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's it's a really really good thrilling movie. There's a lot of great like Tommy Lee Jones and his crew. That th there were some really funny scenes. There were. I mean, it it does action, it does comedy, and I mean, of course, the mystery at the end. I mean, kind of a whodunit, like you said. Right. Uh, it's just a great, great, great movie. 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, like I brought up before. So, where does The Fugitive rank on your top movie echelon? I'm not going to ask you to put it in a specific place, but do you feel like it's worthy of top 10, top 20? On... Well, listen, let's, let's put it in context of Harrison Ford movies. Uh, I would rank it better, and, and this, this may be uh, kind of... And we may get a lot of hate for this, but I would say it's better than any one of his movies except for Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's better than all the Star Wars movies, better than Blade Runner, and well, I've, better. I've actually not seen the Indiana Jones movies, so I can't speak to that. Right. And, well, listen, the people are in love with the Star Wars movies, and they're good movies, but a little bit overrated, I have to say. I love Star Wars. They but, are. But, uh, you know, they're just, they're, they're very good, but they're just not worthy of being a, a cultural phenomenon like they are. Well, I feel like there, I feel like there are two very distinct lists that people confuse when they're talking about the Star Wars movies, and that, and the first three, that is, and those are the list of all-time best movies and the list of all-time most significant or most important movies. If you're talking about what was significant or important from a filmmaking standpoint or from a societal standpoint, then yes, Star Wars is right up there with any movie that's ever been made. But if you're talking about what's the best or what are you most likely to watch if it if it's on on like a random Saturday afternoon, Star Wars would not be high on my list. Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. But yeah, it, in terms of Harrison Ford movies, I'd say it's the second best. And, well, actually, you know, Harrison Ford, he went away for a while, but he's come back in a big way this year. Well, he's why? Well, be we... in, uh, he was in uh, the Jackie Robinson movie. He was he's in gonna... 42? Yeah. And uh, hmm. he's going to be in that this new movie that's coming out next week with uh, Gary Oldman. It looks pretty good. And then he's going to be in Anchorman 2 at the end of the year. Which everyone is looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't concerned for Anchorman 2, because 
I don't want it to soil the reputation of the original Anchorman, and I'm excited for it, but it's more of a cautious excitement. Right, I understand. Well, I I think you can put those characters together in pretty much any situation, and I I would watch it, and I would enjoy it, because they're, the characters are just so... They're just so funny, and, and they've got such good chemistry. Right. It, I mean, if you look at the first movie, the storyline didn't even really matter. It didn't even really make sense. It actually almost kind of, in the end, it kind of hampered the movie a little bit. Right. Like, you didn't really care about the storyline, but mm -hmm. it, it's just like, you put all those characters together, and it's going to be watchable, at the very least. Right. You understand, you understand right? Absolutely. Well, well, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, Fugitive, highly recommend. All right, we're going to try to maybe showcase a different movie every week or two weeks or whatever we decide, uh, because Mark Howe's a big movie guy, I need to watch more of them, and if I do it in the name of broadcasting and doing a radio show, that'll probably motivate me to do my due diligence. So, you know, we'll see where this segment goes, but... Very glad we were able to discuss The Fugitive. Uh, not a lot of sports on this one, primarily pop culture. But rest assured for our sports fan audience that there will there will be shows where we do almost all sports and no pop culture. It just depends on what's going on, what we feel like talking about that day, and a bunch of other stuff. Especially when we get to the NFL season. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, when we get to football and... Even, like, next week or in the next two weeks when we get to fantasy football season, because the prime of fantasy football this year, of like, the majority of the drafts are going to happen, like, third week of August to the end of the first week of September. So when we get into that, we'll be discussing fantasy football a lot more. We're going to try and have guests from our fantasy league on. By the way, Hard Knock, watch the first episode, fantastic. Wow. As always, by the way. Hard Knocks is always really, really good. I do feel like maybe they're going to have trouble convincing teams to let them to let them film Hard Knocks, but it's never not an entertaining product because people are always going to want to see what's going on behind the scenes of an NFL training camp. Yeah, love Hard Knocks. But anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. Um, yeah, but... That's going to pretty much do it for our show today. Uh, can you think of anything I missed, Marco, or anything you want to add? Uh, just check out our Twitter, email, Facebook, all the all that stuff. Yep, uh, Twitter at AM Sports Live one. Uh, email AM Sports Live at gmail dot com. We have Facebook page just AM Sports Live. We are going to be on the air uh, every Tuesday and Friday. And we're going to hope to add guests, theme songs, and all that good stuff. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for this episode. So, see you back here on Friday afternoon. Your August 13th edition of AM Sports Live is now off the air. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>